vibes that I wanted to bring to <laughs> to today's webinar. To today's, yeah. It's cool. like, don't freak out. They're filters. <laughs> They're only filters. They're only filters, guys. The real scary part is the data itself. <laughs> vibes that I vibes that I wanted to bring. Oh man. Okay, so I've got the YouTube live thing going. I am. And uh, yeah, we're getting people coming in. Yay. Hello, Hi, everybody. People. Hello, people. <laughs> Where are you from? What city are you in right now? Oh, yeah. We want to What's know. What's your name? <laughs> Wait. some stuff in the chat. I know. Yeah. Montreal. Montreal. I'm and from I'm Victoria. The sun, because it is kind of sunny. Awesome. The vintage sun again. <laughs> what do you mean? You know, last time I was like, my favorite emoji is, well, not my favorite. Oh. One of the coolest ones is when not the regular moon, the vintage moon, and not yeah. the regular sun, vintage sun. Yeah. Why do they have like certain der derivatives of certain ones? I'll never know. There are some emojis. I'm like, why did they bother picking that one? Yeah. But there's a whole council thing that yeah. meets and, and talks about it. I'm Probably like, there has to, <laughs> it's like, it's like real. Um, maybe it's, it's sort of like, like the Illuminati talking. of texting. <laughs> <laughs> that would be such a cool meeting to go to like, okay, what new drawing should we add in today's language? Yeah, exactly. It out. <laughs> what are we going to let people express with a picture? Let's see. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Maybe that's a bit of like a bucket list life goal sort of uh, item there. <laughs> you know, what if we could get invited to that, Fanny? Dude, that'd be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. We have people from both coasts. Oh, US. nice. Super. Pretty, pretty global. Well, yeah. North America global. <laughs> Well, yeah, I was seeing um, as the registrants were coming in, I was seeing different people registering in a different like default language because when it comes into the mm -hmm. email as like a, someone uh, came in. So I definitely saw saw French in there, saw Spanish in there. Nice. Yeah. So pretty awesome. And lots of lots of different uh, companies and things like that, too. Nice. Yeah. Pretty great, everyone. I'm glad to. Uh, I'm glad peeps are coming through for the for the filtering. <laughs> it's a hot topic, very popular one. Yeah, I, I was feeling it. Uh, people might be like, "Hey, that's really specific to what I'm working on. Let me join." Yep, <laughs> totally. Well, we did get a tweet last week um, from somebody who was in, I think, New Zealand, saying like, "I was super blocked on my interactions, and all I could find was e-commerce <laughs> examples." Yeah, Thank you. Honestly, that's exactly the deal. I feel yeah. the same. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Sweet. Cool. All right, peeps. Well, how about we get started? Sure. Let's, let's get go going. Ahead. Yeah. Okay, let me pause the music. Okay, buy the tunes. Buy the tunes. <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, welcome everyone um, to level up your UX game, Enterprise Filters. Uh, so yeah, to kind of start things off, uh, especially for peeps who have not been with us uh, for a webinar yet. Um, who are we anyways? Uh, so my name is Kira Crawshaw. Um, I, I'm a founder, lead UX, uh, came to user experience through uh, science and biotech, science communications, um, and now I'm the founder uh, for Pencil and Paper. Cool. Yeah, I'm Fanny. I'm a lead UX designer with Kira over at PNP, Pencil and Paper. Um, and my enterprise, my UX background is really around enterprise as well. Um, I've touched on different industries uh, like fintech, um, education, and more recently, biotech and those juicy, complex uh, projects. So I'm really excited to share this, this stuff with all with you guys. Awesome. And so Pencil and Paper, uh, as a company, we're a specialist user experience design firm for complex industries. And so our 
vision in the world is to set the standards and best practices of user experience design in these complex industries and uh, increase people's cognitive potential in their work and life. Cool. So about the pattern analysis library, um, which this webinar is a part of, you might have joined us in past sessions. Um, so we've basically been working on this library of enterprise focused UX content. Um, and so for now, we've touched on uh, these four topics that you can see on the screen. Um, I'm going to paste actually the link to the long form article of this of today's topic, which is what uh, which is where the webinars kind of came from um, these kind of deep dive analysis. And so yeah, we have a bunch of more content in the pipeline, uh, but we also want to know if you might have special requests, uh, specific UX patterns or problems that you are struggling with, you might want us to kind of look at from a, an enterprise uh, angle. I'm also going to paste a link to a form that we have. So if you have ideas and suggestions, we would love to know. Yeah. And yeah, so maybe also a bit about, about the, our motivation or the, the, the decision behind, behind this initiative. Um, as obviously we, we've seen it, have, as some people also share, we have kind of found a lack of design resources around specifically enterprise um, UX design. And we had a hard time finding the exact answers to the really typical uh, specific problems we were having. And it's like the information that is available is not really in depth enough. Uh, it's, it's like there's a feeling of people are, aren't able to, to kind of convey that complexity in writing maybe, I don't know. There's also maybe a dimension of some of these, again, enterprise focused solutions are, are made by in-house teams and there might be a reluctance to share that kind of internal knowledge. And so we really wanted to go right in there and break that wall and, and make sure this, these principles and this universal language is shared and, and could be applied really to any um, software or problem. Yeah, awesome. So a quick reminder. Um, so we have a, a circle community um, and so we're, we're getting more and more cool topics and people talking about different things in there. So it's, it's becoming really enjoyable. Um, it's geared towards nerdy UX practitioners. And so the UX, you know, I'm really talking about designers, but also developers, product people, people that are, you know, would consider themselves in like a UX oriented uh, type of deal. So, um, so within uh, our community, we, we sort of, avoid topics about the design industry, like check out your portfolio. How do I get into user experience? What's, you know, whatever. <laughs> so those sort of topics, they're really well covered all across the internet with uh, different communities. So we really tried to stick to kind of the applied UX uh, in these different uh, inter interesting industries and just really nerd out hard, you know, similar to, <laughs> to like these sessions that you're seeing. Cool. So about today's topic, why should you care and give a damn about filters and also what you can look forward to in today's webinar format. So disclaimer, we've said it before, but we won't be looking at filters from an e-commerce perspective. Uh, there's a bunch of resources out there for, just for that, but we, we really want to look at it from the enterprise point of view. Um, in a sense, enterprise filtering is really unique because it has to deal with much more complexity. Uh, you typically don't prescribe as let's say the product team or the, the product people, you don't get to choose what's gonna be shown in there. It's typically user generated content and stuff with unpredictable lengths and an unpredictable amount of custom fields. So there's like all of this to deal with. Um, and you really wanna craft a, a good experience for your users to not have to learn how to filter and they could really, and, and for them to really just use filters as an accelerator, a vehicle towards reaching their, their perfect view, their perfect setup um, to get to work quickly. And for today's session, we'll go through a couple, a couple sections. We first gonna, we're first gonna guide you uh, through a couple of prompts, discussion ideas that you can start having with your teammates um, to help you kind of uh, to know what to consider to scope out your filtering project <laughs> or component. Um, we'll also look at a bunch of examples. So we'll, we're, we kind of targeted uh, the best practices for the typical use case you're, you're going to encounter, use cases. 
And we'll also make sure to keep some time at the end for questions if ever uh, you're dealing with something on your, on your side, on your team. So make sure you, to use the Q&A uh, feature in Zoom to drop some questions down there. And we'll have a period at the end just for that. Yeah, awesome. All right, so on to things, uh, things to consider around uh, your filtering feature set. So the first, uh, the first area of consideration you kind of want to start with is really thinking and, and mapping out your data. Uh, what's your data made of? Um, so here, you know, we want to start thinking about what are the data points themselves? You know, you may have been working on this thing uh, for a while, but you don't know every single one. Um, and so that's something that you really want to understand. The hierarchy uh, within your database as well is really important to understand. Um, that will really help you to kind of fill out the fill out the gaps um, with with your data. You want to understand what kind of values your different data points have as well. So are they a string? Are they a boolean? Like what's what kind of uh, values are actually within your data columns themselves? Um, are those uh, are certain um, data points associated with a time frame or a date? Like do you have historical data on those things? Um, is it numerical? Is it text? So really doing, doing a bit of a level set to understand what you have to work with is a great place to start. And that will start to inform how you're going to display that data as well. Right. And then you also want to make sure you mirror all the data points that are in your uh, entries, mirror them all in the filters. So you've, you've done the job of mapping, mapping out your data structure. You've chosen specific and data points to show in your interface. And now your users have come to be expecting to use those, those data points. So really making sure everything's kind of one for one uh, fitted in those filters is going to be a really core, core part of it. Yeah, totally. Um, and then the other, other piece of the puzzle as well is really starting to think about users' priorities around, around their data. So you may want to figure out the right sort of order that you would put your filters in. Um, you know, do they, uh, do they sort of ask a specific question when they come into a screen? Uh, that's pretty typical. So, um, you know, high traffic uh, properties deserve quicker access and higher visibility in your filter component. Um, with fewer values, you need to be pretty hands-on in deciding which comes first. This is really that user-centered part of things. Um, also with a greater set of values, you're better, better off implementing a simple alphabetical order on, on some of your data as well, as you can see in the, um, some of these examples. Right, and then in the, in the idea of scoping your work, you also wanna know when to stop and when does filtering become overkill? Uh, so this is really depends on your team's like capacity or bandwidth, really. But you might not need to invest uh, a sprint or two sprints uh, building like an advanced filter experience for a ten-item list. So the rule of thumb here is really to make sure the depth of that filtering experience reflects the depth and volume of the data itself. So you kind of want to prioritize the bigger <laughs> uh, data sets uh, of your of your app. Well, cool. Let's look at some patterns. <laughs> and now it's spoiled, but <laughs> I want to take a little step back um, before looking at the applied ways to use filters in your in, in your application. But we we typically we know what a filter is just because it's everywhere. It's used in all of these different industries and, and use cases. But what is a filter actually made of? So I want us to look at exactly the ana the anatomy of a filter. <laughs> Uh, let me explain. So uh, conceptually, a filter is made up of three parts. You have an identifier, a relative, and a value. The identifier is the targeted property or category that you want to call in the system, right? So this is like the status, the name, the client name, the group of values. Then the value is the, spe the specific value, okay, I'm repeating myself, but the specific like amount, uh, threshold, specific date that you really want to drill down to. And in between those two things, there's the relative, which is the intended relation you want the identifier and value to have. 
Um, the default here is equals. A typical filter is I pick the identifier, I want it to be um, 10 or 29, uh, I don't know. Um, but the relative is, uh, is also used between uh, criteria. Let's go there <laughs> a little bit deeper. When you have a group of these three things together, um, this combo makes a variable, uh, also known as a condition or a criteria or a filter. And then these filters can stack together with, again, relatives in between, determining the logic of the, uh, let's say, an, ad an additive list of criteria. So selecting the relative isn't typically up to the user in typical uh, filters. Um, it's typically the equals. And then the relatives are, are also sometimes packaged in like preset options um, that you as a system kind of prescribe and make a preset available for, for them. And uh, yeah, so we're, we're not actually, actually gonna touch uh, on advanced filtering today, but it's, it's in an advanced filtering experience that you would let the user pick exactly the relation they want between their, their variables or between the identifier and value. Nice. So that's the anatomy. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Okay, so uh, so next we have inputs, um, and so we'll go through and, and kind of chat about this. So let's let's be thinking about. So we have our three pieces of a filter, and now we're doing some of our selection uh, within our choices. So we have uh, lots of selection mechanisms. So um, you can often have uh, values that are actually a list. Uh, of items that you can choose from. So on the left, we have a uh, checkbox. Um, and on the right, we have radio buttons. So checkboxes or multi uh, check checklists are really handy for like multi select use cases. Um, and radio buttons are mutually exclusive. So you can choose. It's an or kind of situation, not an and kind of situation. So, um, so this would be, you know, Kind of talking about the prompts thing again this would be when you would want to ask some of those questions of should we make this mutually exclusive or should we make this a multi-select uh, kind of scenario next we've got booleans um so you know you can handle these in different ways um, but a boolean is really a yes no true false kind of situation and so there's always there's just there's just these two two choices um, involved and so on the left, um, we have a, a radio button drop down showing, but you may not need to use something as UI heavy as that. You could potentially get a little bit more efficient in uh, your space and uh, just do a check, uh, check mark or uh, toggle or something like that um, uh, as a choice. Then we have search. So, you know, these, these drop down menus, super handy. Also, though, we see a lot of use cases where, uh, like Fanny was alluding to, you have, you know, a lot of entries. So you get to a point, maybe <laughs> past whatever, 10, where you need to start searching uh, within that component itself. And so, um, you, and also for cases where you don't actually understand what the volume of entries is going to be because they're user generated or they're generated by a machine or whatever the case is. So you need to kind of like, um, you know, make sure uh, you won't get into trouble, <laughs> basically. So, uh, so you can use a search, uh, search functionality, and, uh, you know, a type search, you just start typing and, and see things or, um, uh, yeah. And so one trick that's really nice to make that interaction really smooth is to stick, stick the search at the top so you don't lose context of what you're actually typing. Because what you're doing is you're you're searching in this tiny little area, and you're also potentially scrolling in it, stuff like that. So there's like a lot going on there, and you don't want to be losing the losing the narrative thread of what you're doing. Um, and then another really subtle sort of interaction thing that you can do there too is make it autofocused so that the cursor's in there right away. You don't have to like click into it again or do you know do another step. So that's quite that one's quite subtle, um, but can really uh, make a difference. And then we have a very jazzy <laughs> situation here. So some types of data can really benefit from a visual filtering mechanism. So here we have, um, we've got a, a dashboard 
And the data is really um, location dependent and you can view that location. It's a specific shape and you can select it. So the dashboard itself is totally refreshing based on your map selection. And so that's a really nice uh, intuitive way to do things um, if, if you can, if, if the time is, if it's an appropriate kind of use case. Right. Once you've started, once you've had um, time mapping out the right inputs for the right data points, um, you're starting to have a filter component that you need to place somewhere. So let's look at some options for positioning. You basically have three options um, and they depend on your needs in terms of the contextuality of it and the scalability you need. So let's look at the examples from these, uh, these criteria. First option is the filter sidebar. Uh, so typically on the left hand side, this is a very high scalability, has a very high scalability factor, meaning that uh, you can use the whole, the whole height and have a bunch of scrolls in there. So there's a lot of room for you, for you to play with. But on the other hand, it has a lower level of context because it, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, it's a, less, a little bit less precise because it, since it's a left-hand sidebar, it affects the whole page. Um, it's a really global component. So you really need to make sure that it indeed affects every single thing that's present on the page, uh, or you might risk creating some confusion uh, around that. Next, we have the option to, to build inline filters. So let's say you have a dashboard made up of different kind of cards with different charts in there, and they, can, they all have their a different data structure or a discrepant data structure. You can't really have a global filtering mechanism on that page. So you really, you really need to have your filters be in context, in component. Um, so something like this can work. It has a high level of contextualizability. <laughs> Context. That sounds right. <laughs> but then it's also not very scalable because they you're gonna have like let's say three or four at a time visible on a page, so you have less room to play with. You can't easily scale the number of drop down uh, of inputs that you can that you can show in there. Um, but you could also mix and match it with another type of global filter for those pieces of the data that are global. So let's say the date can affect everything. You would have the date at the top, but then the more specific ones nested inside the components. Um, so that's the second. And then the other option is to have a top bar. So this is kind of the hybrid middle ground where it can be highly contextual, where it, whereas it can be specific to a certain section of the page and you could have different top bars for different sections. Um, or you could have it global as well, as, uh, just as global as the sidebar where it just sits at the very top and affects the whole page. And then in terms of scalability, it's kind of a medium because you do have the constraint of the max width of the page. Um, and you can quickly run into that limit with long strings, long labels, but then you could kind of wrap it and have multiple lines uh, to display everything you need. So that's a, that, those are the kind of the criteria you might want to look at uh, to pick your positioning. Awesome, all right. So you, you kind of know where it is, let's say. <laughs> so, uh, so now let's think a little bit about interaction. Click all the things. So, uh, for, so for our side, our um, sidebar option here, you can, um, you can basically expand or uh, expand and collapse these different sections, right? So this is what Fanny is really getting at around the scalability of some of this stuff, right? So if you don't know, especially if you don't know how long this is gonna be, you'll have space kind of for everything. So you're sort of safe. Um, another thing you can do though, if, if you do, do take an approach like this is uh, to make some decisions around the defaults that are shown. So um, this is again, where that, that user uh, need kind of interaction uh, comes through and you can decide to maybe have it expanded, a few of them expanded by default that are especially ones that are used by people all the time. Um, and this can really help the discoverability of that area, right? Because if you can see some examples of it in an, another state compared to it in a kind of a default state, um, that's a nice reinforcement. All right, and then uh, table header filtering as well. So this is like, kind of the ultimate um, 
top are <laughs> sort of thing. It's very, very contextualized. Um, you know, if you write in that column right at that time, you have a really high level of context uh, for users. And typically that, that you know, that kind of uh, per column filtering also comes with like an instantaneous output once you you've done, uh, you've selected the filter that you want. And then we have another option here as well, um, applied lozenges. So this is especially handy if you have additive variables, you are kind of um, presenting a story um, with your filters and, you, and those kind of could build up across the screen. Um, and so they're a great way to convey uh, meaning they're like using lozenges. Um, they're really handy. You can make them really high contrast as well to the rest of the page uh, if you want uh, to make it really noticeable. Um, and they're typically super easy to remove as well. Um, I have them a, a bit as a favorite myself because you just like click on it and it's so fast. And then date pickers. These, these guys, we've all dealt with these uh, with different experiences, right? Um, and so what you wanna do when you're considering a date picker, say you're, say you're even building it from scratch or maybe you're judging some of them that might be in a library or something like that. Um, so what you wanna do is really ensure that the sequential order of, the, of, of your selection is maintained. So you really wanna make it dummy proof you know, you've all, like, I don't know, I was on the CRA website, Government of Canada recently, and I was like, okay, I just did a weird date range. It's like somehow one is in the past from the other and I can't switch it. And, you know, so you really wanna avoid that kind of usability snafus that are like quite easy to avoid. Um, number two, visibility um, on the selection. So that's a really, that's like a really subtle one too. So if you're doing a big, uh, a big range of time and it's really, really, uh, uh, you know, specific to the day and you're going back multiple months, you really want a secondary way to show that initial selection that you made. So you want to kind of reinforce that. That's the, the order that you're sort of always reinforcing. And then number three, present options and a custom selection. So there's lots of uh, typical presets that you would likely see in a date picker. So you would see uh, you know, today, yesterday, this week, last week, last month, last year, you know, all of those things that are super fast uh, for people to be querying. Cool. Now, your users, your users have made some selections using the right inputs based on the right data, and they've interacted with your drop downs and expandable sections. And now you actually need to show them results. Uh, so when do filters end? when they click on apply. So <laughs> there's different uh, ways to handle fetching. This really depends on how fast your system can be. Um, and there's different UI mechanisms to account for those uh, different methods. So first uh, option is to fetch results instantly. So live fetching. So this, is a, this would be a case where as soon as the user makes a selection in the dropdown or the, or the expanded section, the data is automatically reflect, refreshed and shows the filtered results. So this would be expected uh, in use cases where there's kind of lower stakes uh, interaction or at least like interacting with a smaller list of values. Because um, as soon as you're dealing with multi-select uh, or more complex inputs, you want to add a bit more friction and potentially a secondary trigger. So the next example, a per filter fetching mechanism. So use case for this is multi-select because you want to keep the drop down there and open until they've done they finish their their input so you don't want you don't want to kind of have users be confused between clicking on something having the result refresh and then opening it again and clicking again um, so this kind of distract distraction would would really not be good <laughs> so having a per filter fetching mechanism would really let them just go into a specific identifier, make the selection they want, and they trigger the result when they're ready. And this, this can be done either by clicking um, an apply button, like an explicit apply button, or just clicking out of a dropdown um, and then fetching the results. And then thirdly is to, to fetch the results only once at the very end of the whole selection. So this could be really useful for heavier data sets or lower performing apps. We all know we have a bunch of reasons why um, these system mechanisms 
behave the way they do. Uh, but so yeah, for, for users who would navigate at the users would navigate the various drop downs, they could search inside the drop downs, scroll as they want, um, take the time to select exactly what they need. Because typically they're in a mindset of, okay, I have this huge list of like 30,000 items, perhaps, and I have exactly one in mind that I'm, I know I'm looking for. So giving them the time to really craft the exact uh, query they want, and then hitting apply only once, you're just accelerating the workflow super, super well, because then they are exactly where they need to go by the end. Nice. Yeah, so, um, so we fetch the data, we're gonna display the results. All right, so, um, so one thing to keep in mind as you're, as you're thinking about showing, you know, not just the results, but also kind of the state, indicating the state of the page related to the filters is to embrace, embrace redundancy. So, um, you know, you don't need to cheap out on, <laughs> on visual feedback in this context. Um, so the first one, the, the keyest, most keyest one is really to keep the active filters visible in their original context. So um, I, I don't know, I've had these experiences, especially on mobile, where you do a filtering, and then you have a list that's shown. And then I'm like, am I in a filtered state or not? Did it just refresh? Did my filter even work? You know, those are the questions that you want to avoid at all costs. <laughs> um, and so uh, the second one is to indicate which filters have a nested selection. So in this case, what we mean here is that we can see that shipment status all is uh, what someone selected. And you can see within the component itself that that was selected. Um, but we looked at kind of secondary mechanisms as well to show which things were selected. So it's not, you know, so we're, we're talking about sort of show it in the exact component as well as show it in a very, in a more verbose sort of display as well. Um, and that's kind of what we're getting at with number three. So display them in a dedicated applied filter summary section. All right, so we've seen an example of this here. So in our sidebar, we have a really nice example of this where um, we can see that the status, um, the status item there has a, an indicator. Uh, beside it. And then also at the top, we have uh, more details around uh, the actual values uh, that are that are being applied. Um, so that's a super nice uh, way to display that kind of handy thing about that too, is because it's at the top of your list. Um, you're, you can't really ignore it. So you're more users are more likely to see it. Uh, if it was at the bottom building up, it might be harder to spot. So same deal here as well. So you can kind of do the do the interaction in one place and also be reinforcing um, the state of the page kind of above the results. And that's what this is showing here with the lozenges at the top. So um, yeah, so you can have a summary kind of positioned at the top of the page. And then another another choice you have as well is to show uh, the filters, uh, show that the details of the filters just below the filter itself. So the extension of that first slide that we saw. Um, so we can see that, you know, status is, oh, that's that's chosen. And then below it, we say, oh, initial analysis. Cool. OK, that's that's what I chose in that drop down. And then another another jazzy uh, thing that you can do here, too, is actually um, sort of do a proactive communication type of idea here, where you actually show the results prior to running the query. So that's a really cool um, piece of info that you can get up front, and you can start to make decisions as a user, like, how many things do I want to see? So this is a Airbnb uh, example here that we have. And um, you know, they're getting it, the user's getting it down from like 10 to seven different different choices that they're going to get. So that can be a really nice, um, a really nice mechanism there because you don't want 100,000, right? You have to know, it's hard to tell how many results you're going to get uh, when you're actually doing a filter. And this could also prevent any case for uh, an empty state because if there's no oh, results, yes. click the button. So another yeah, win. totally. Another win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. And that's all the things <laughs> that we uh, put together today to talk to you about with filtering. Uh, do we have any uh, questions, Bruin, Fanny? 
in the Q&A? We do. Yeah, there's a couple questions oh. in the Q&A uh, panel. So should I pick one? Yeah, go, go um, Matt's on it. There's, there is one with, that we kind of um, answered just now. We hadn't touched on the applied filters section yet, but I think that should be answered. There is one about wh what are good ways to do and or between multiple filters? Um, so yeah, this I think relates to kind of the my anatomy thing where, as I mentioned, we were not, we didn't touch on uh, advanced filtering today. We do have a section about that on our, on our art article that I, that I pasted just earlier in the chat. So you can maybe take that out. But the idea is kind of in advanced filtering, you would enter kind of a secondary mode, typically in a, in a modal somewhere else, you're kind of inside this new thing that's all about setting the right criteria. And then it's really kind of building up a formula the, the best ways I've seen it done, at least, it's, it's really a formula where you kind of create, you select your, uh, identify your relative and value per variable or criteria. And then you kind of get, you kind of get the options to, I want all of these to be additive. So um, show me results that, that match all one or none of these results, of these criteria. So there are kind of different ways to, to build it up. Uh, but it's mm -hmm. typically, yeah, it typically exists kind of, kind of as a, at a secondary level if you really need to go uh, yeah. granular. Yeah, I did, um, I did an, an interaction that was sort of like uh, building that up, that idea up. So, um, so the use case was sort of a workflow situation where you could define if um, certain things uh, passed a, a QC step, then they could go to the next step, they would go to step two or they'd go to step five according to these different criteria. So what I did for that one is I built it up in a sentence almost across. Yeah. yeah. And then that sentence itself was, you know, a piece of, uh, what did you call it, Fanny? Formula? Or in the formula. Well, it was like a very, it wasn't a variable, but criteria. anyway. <laughs> criteria, yes. And then that also had an and or, That's it. <laughs> or like an or and thing. And then another whole one. So I, I built it up sort of across and then separated them like that so that you could kind of read and differentiate between them. So something mm -hmm. to try. <laughs> cool. So I hope we answered your question, anonymous attendee. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a question from Benoit Meunier. Um, what are the design systems you know that have the best filter components? That's a very Ooh, good question. That is a very good question. <laughs> Do we have an answer? No, <laughs> I don't have a. I the last time I spent like an evening just browsing design systems. Yeah, I've been. I don't know. I my experience when I've been kind of looking deep into different ones like Material or whatever. I'm like, oh, where's the thing that I really want? Like you usually see. I mean, what I've seen a lot is they're just a little bit less than what I need. Um, that's kind of, kind of yeah. been my experience. But let's uh, let's bring that that discussion to circle and see if we can crowdsource the answer for you, Benoit. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure people have some ideas. Yeah. Um, okay, we have another one from Hang Lee. In the example of the map filter that Kira showed, how could we improve the discoverability of the map filter without showing the filter bar at the bottom when it's not triggered? Hmm. So remember how when you click on that country, you just get that immediate feedback that you have just yeah. filtered by country. Yeah. Name. So yeah, the discoverability. So you could like, you could have like in a situation like that, you could have it also displayed maybe at the top of the page or something in a in a header. So you could by by default, let's say you just um, you just have Australia. <laughs> Uh, selected by default so it could say you know Australia at the top and then and then all the data below um, and maybe you could start to pick from there and it would be reflected like it would kind of reflect mm. um, feel like a label some kind of label or like a default setting might make that more discoverable what do you think Fanny mm -hmm. yeah I agree with the idea of having it kind of live in two places so that let's say you would have like a country picker somewhere at the global level and where, yeah, you would be shown, let's say the default is Australia because that's where, let's say you're based. Um, and then you would 
automatically kind of um, link together the visual of that applied filter and then the visual of Australia being colored on the map or kind of, you know, mm -hmm. out. and then if you would switch it around inside that drop down, you would see the map reflect that back. So many, maybe then potentially you'd learn to know there, there's kind of this feedback in between those two pieces that yeah. can help you kind of inter interact with the map directly. Uh, later yeah, on. that would be good too. Cause you can't, you can't uh, assume that everyone can see um, and select through the, the visual of it too. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, and, yeah. Yeah. So if you have, um, if you have that kind of as a primary thing on the screen, uh, that could be, that could be handy. But what my question would be like, is the default of all countries, would that actually be noticeable? I don't think it would be. <laughs> I think you would hmm. probably want to make some kind of selection, but, um, but that might be wildly inappropriate for that user's use case. <laughs> That's it. It really depends what they're there to see. If, if that dashboard makes sense to have the, the global aggregated data of the whole country selected at once. Mm -hmm. So things to try and test. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, and then the other question was actually someone asking for a link and then someone else pasted the link. Okay. So Thank you, the person that pasted it. Are the questions? Oh, there's some stuff going on in the chat. These and filters uh, Regis knows of, the smart sheet design system, I'm guessing. Oh, so see, okay. we're already getting some crowdsourced answers. Look at that. Boom. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, that, that was, those were all really good questions. I feel like, I mean, doing this talk, I'm like, oh man, we could, we could probably talk about this like for a week. Um. <laughs> Didn't even touch on advanced filters. That was my, no. I mean, if I could do a session only on that, I would love it, but you yeah. know. It, You'd probably like, need like five. <laughs> yeah, no, honestly, it's, it's a whole thing. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, and this is, uh, you know, this is the final episode of this series for now. Um, so for us, we were doing this uh, experiment of these webinars and these deep dives and it's been a really wonderful experience to, to be able to talk about this stuff and not feel too nerdy in the process, <laughs> you know, not feel like it's TMI for the crew. So that's been really good, I think, uh, from my perspective. What about you, Fanny? Yeah, me too, honestly. I never thought yeah. we'd have so much fun just nerding out on this. <laughs> I know. And, and the answers and, and questions that we've had from people uh, has been, have been great also. So yeah, really yeah, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks everyone who's come um, to any of these of these sessions with us, and especially people too that have come to more than one. Um, that's really awesome to see and, and really validating of, of us creating this content in the first place. So um, we will be doing more live events coming up. So we'll let you know uh, what's coming down the pipeline. Um, so some of them will be more deep dive stuff, some things um, are going to be a bit more casual, like fireside chats. So we'll keep you we'll keep you in the loop um, on our upcoming dreams and schemes, and uh, also ask for your feedback and your interest in in some of our ideas. Woohoo! Okay, well, um, yeah. So just keep in mind uh, that you can join us on Circle and you know continue to nerd out about our various topics. Um, we're also going through the process of creating a course targeted uh, to developers wanting to up their UX game. Um, so you can check out our, um, our landing page that talks about the UX skills for developers course if you're interested or know somebody who might benefit. And uh, like follow us on the LinkedIn and the Twitter um, and of course dev.to as well and uh, keep in touch with us. <laughs> awesome okay well thank you again everyone uh thanks for joining us for this whole series and uh we'll see you soon thank you so much have a good weekend <laughs>